matchless.
between 
Who says there ain't no grave that can hold his body down. There ain't no grave that can hold his body down. When he heard that trumpet sound, he rose up out of the ground. Could, uh, there ain't no grave that can hold his body down. We need to do it one more time. This one's about Jesus, remember? There was a battle between death and life. There on a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. But he went down to hell. He took back every key.
see how big we can make his throne. Right here, right now. Because when his throne is established, he rules. He reigns. He has dominion and authority. shared this with this group, but there's some here that don't know us and don't know Randy. The thing that, that has been so precious to me about this family is the way that they have loved my family. And I don't have a lot of um, ministers that I really think the world of. That's no disrespect to ministers. It's just that's just how it is. But my brother and his family, Christopher, over in Orlando, who's a part of Dan Linda's Church over in Nations, has been sent out from this meeting. Um, if you guys know C-Fan, uh, anybody heard Christ for All Nations yeah. over in Orlando? Reinhard Bunky ring a bell to anybody? Yeah. Anybody yeah. know that name? His successor? So Christopher is over there, and, and he has just served my brother over the years with great godly counsel. But not just that, just helps minister. I can't even... I think um, Kyla has probably angel wings underneath her spaghetti straps because she's been there, and I honestly, I wouldn't do it for my own brother, if I'm being honest. But there's just a heart to really serve the, the minister, and I'm sure it comes because they didn't see it during their time as ministry, as a family, and I'm just so thankful for you guys. I really mean that. It's, it's, it's the thing that speaks the loudest of above everything else is your heart to love people. And I'm completely humbled and touched to see that there are servants like this in the earth. Have you ever been served so well and you're so humbled by the, the, the hospitality that you've received? You're like, oh my God, who are you? How do you do this? That's kind of how this family has made me feel, even from afar. So um, we're not best friends. I, I love this family, but that's just my little take on, on their lives. Um, I know that we have other meetings this week. Uh, Wednesday, I know Steve's back on with this foundation meeting at 6.30. If you don't know what foundations are, these aren't the foundations of this church. If you go into Hebrews chapter 5, it talks about by now you should be teachers. But now you need to go learn again the foundation principles. It's really important, especially for you younger ones or the ones that maybe just came to know the Lord in the recent, like, last couple years, that you get established in the faith that these foundations are laid in your life. The Bible says by now you should be teachers. That's the, that's, it's not that you should be students. You should be teaching. But you've got to learn these foundations to be able to teach. Not just to know them and pay. I know what the foundation I know where they are. They're Hebrews 6, 1 through 6. I know where they're located. That's not good enough. They need to be placed in you and established. And we have an amazing teacher, a gift of the teacher in Steve, yeah. who can break open revelation and, uh, and also lay foundations in your life. And the great news is these foundations go with you wherever you're going to go. You know, foundations are important to a building, they're important to your faith. 
maximum of importance. And so I just want to encourage you, if you want to sit under an expert level instructor who is seasoned, double seasoned, I think is what they call it. Yep. Like ever, anyway. Double seasoned. He is there and he is at 6.30 on Wednesdays at uh, here. How about these flowers up here? Yeah. 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 So, Ty, Teresa, no, Nicole, Tess. Tess, sorry. Who, if you were part of the flower posse, so raise your hand. We want to honor you. We want to, okay. Is there, is there anybody else that didn't get honored on that? Because that, because these are making my day right now. Yeah. I'm a flower guy. Don't judge me. I know Tim does that wear magenta, but that's yeah. you know, something you got to do. <laughs> Who's fired up for to hear a little? Bit? Yeah. 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 I don't want to take a Glad you guys here. You're so welcome to be here. We're honored that you're uh, spending uh, your Easter day with us. I know they're doing something for the kids later too. Easter, Easter egg hunts. Uh, now I saw just a point of procedure before we move any further. I saw an Easter egg hunt go awry the other day. It was at a private Christian school, and they just laid the Easter eggs all out through the field, and they're just kids, you know, bombing this field, and they're just picking up. They're just everywhere. That ain't how it is. We hide them out here. <laughs> okay, so you got to work. You got to search. You know, wood, hay, and stubble's everywhere. If you want the silver and gold, you got to dig for it. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna hide some stuff. So um, you might you may want to tag along with your kids as they walk around. Please welcome Randy up here. to you, and uh, we'll mess around and turn that over and put my iPad over there. Um, thank you so much for praying for my uh, granddaughter, um, most of you know, that uh, <clears throat> almost a month ago, uh, I guess it's been, I guess it's been, um, let's see, two, three, almost almost a month. Um, then on 5 o'clock in the morning, they came in to my daughter-in-law, who was um, 23 weeks pregnant, and told her they had to take the baby or she was going to die. And so that was quite a choice that my, that my son and daughter-in-law had to make that morning, and they gave us zero hope that there would be even she couldn't have lungs, and my son FaceTimed me from outside the room where they done it. He says, Siri, um, and uh, he was crying. And he said, Dad, she's alive. Because when they pulled that one pound, three ounce baby girl out of the mother, she began to cry. So that meant she had lungs. And uh, we've had some struggles, and, uh, but she is, has been doing well. It was a bit of a setback yesterday. Uh, they had her oxygen level that she was breathing with down to less than 20%. Uh, but because they're picking at her, my wife, I've been on the phone outside my wife, and uh, she's getting irritated. So she is her grandfather's daughter, granddaughter uh, because people are prodding at her. Her oxygen levels dropped quite a bit. So we're believing today that the infection that has uh, there, it's going to just go away today, and uh, she'll be all right. So, pray, pray all right. right. Pray right now. Yes. I have been. Well, let's Join all pray. Let's go. Join together. Father, I thank you today for Rena Jane, a gift from you. Reach down in Tulsa as we call out. Satan is a liar. Your promises are true. I thank you on this beautiful Easter day that we have a story to tell of your healing grace and power in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Always a joy to be here with um, you guys, the Clemens family. I don't do much holiday preaching. I don't usually preach on Easter. Um, I don't preach on Christmas when it falls on a Sunday. I'm not a big topical preacher. Um, and if you're here today, if you're a visitor here at this church, you should come back next week because um, um, the real pastor will be here um, with Jason to speak but today I'm going to mess you up so let me get this out of the way happy Easter um, I was here Friday night in the Good Friday service and it's the day that we celebrate that Jesus Christ was crucified and uh, on Friday afternoon resurrected Sunday morning. According to the word of God, they ain't neither one of those true. So, have Easter. <laughs> um, <laughs> take a deep breath. You're going to need some for today. Um, I go with the words of Jesus and Jesus made the statement and said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So how you can get 72 hours between Friday afternoon and Sunday morning is beyond my comprehension. Unless you're doing common core math. And that's a whole other ball game, man. If you've seen some of the common core math problems, if you have three bananas, and you add five oranges, what color is your sweater next Tuesday? <laughs> I have no idea. Just put an F on it and I'll go home. And uh, so you've done messed up my Easter. You should hear what I can do with Christmas. Uh, but it uh, has nothing to do with your salvation. The Bible makes uh, of knowing, yea, when it was, or whatever. The Bible makes it very clear that without a vision, my people perish. Okay? You don't have a vision, you come to church, you go home, come to church, you go home, and you can fade away, see you in glory. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful eternity. You're washed in the blood of Jesus. But the Bible makes it very clear, without a vision, my people perish, but my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. You don't have a vision, you can just come to church and fade away. If you don't have knowledge, the enemy is out to destroy you. It is not the singing that Satan is worried about. It is not your praise and worship. If you're of a Pentecostal persuasion, it's not your talking in tongues that gets rid of the devil. The presence of God will not get rid of the enemy. It does not. The presence makes you feel good, but doesn't get rid of the enemy. I've been raised in church my whole life. I don't know how many of y'all was raised Pentecostal. I was raised Pentecostal. So the toughest things I ever got over was a Pentecostal Bible Belt church raising. Because when I went to church, everything was a sin. You had fun, you're going to hell. Um, there was usually a bus in the parking lot Sunday afternoon going to take a load that day to hell. And I, was always, I was always slated to drive. And uh, shotgun. <laughs> and uh, so that's just kind of how I grew up. And uh, when I got to know as the late teenage years of who God actually is, I said last night I do need to apologize to um, um, the ladies um, Brother Jason and Brother Brian stayed at the house last night. We were staying and we got to talking, and, and it was after one o'clock. So, my apologies to the ladies. She's next door with the kids, but she's done. I'll tell her, and then she'll tell me how he didn't really say that. He didn't really, yeah, okay, that's exactly right. So, I don't mean it, it's just what I'm supposed to say. You know? and, uh, but, but nonetheless, um, if you do not understand, the word of God and you're not interested in having the foundation of the word of God in 2024 starting this spring you are in trouble because there is a plan by the enemy to destroy the legitimacy of the word of God which is the foundation of God's truth period now people start with all oh, the word of God the Bible was written by men no, no it wasn't no it wasn't through the hand of men but it was written by God, according to Hebrew and the writers of old. When you're talking about the writers of old, it's a Hebrew phrase. If I were to teach you how to write in Hebrew, 
I would place my hand upon your hand and help you form the letters. That's what the Bible says that God done with the prophets and the men of old. That's exactly what he done. And so if you are not a believer of the word of God, uh, you and I are on opposite sides of the fence, and I probably can't help you because everything that I am, everything that I believe, the foundation of my very character is based upon the word of God being true. Now, there's a lot of things in the word of God that people don't know are there. I'm going to touch on some of those today here in just a moment. But um, I can tell you what's not in the word of God, but your opinion. <laughs> So when you have a resolve that the Word of God is the inspired Word of God, you're off to a great start. Now it is Easter, and um, I know everybody goes to church on Easter, but you go to church on Easter, you go to hell on the other. And um, you know, kind of like the rule of Christianity, <laughs> Easter and Christmas, got to be there. And um, but but that's all fine. It doesn't matter to me if somebody goes to church one time a year, two times a year, every Sunday. Doesn't matter to me. That's between you and God. I think you're wrong by not going because you need the truth. Amen. How you can get through this life without the foundation of the Word of God is beyond my comprehension. And you need to know that the Bible is written by the hand of God. Men have interpreted it. There are many different translations. Uh, they've got a new one now um, called the Gen Z or something. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hilarious. Honestly, um, if God actually talks like that, that that's fine. Um, I don't think he does, nor does he talk in King James, thus and thou and this. So I've been preaching 42 years. 42 years of, um, I'm 42 years old. Let's just go with that. Um, <laughs> uh, I started preaching right before I turned 20, and I'll be 61 this coming July. And I'm in agreement with you. I look astounding for my age. I understand that. Because <laughs> um, I know that was a thought that popped in your head. But um, I do read the King James Version because it's what we were taught growing up. See, when we grew up as children, five boys and a girl in my family, mom and dad Pentecostal, we didn't have time out. They didn't, time out was for football. That was it. Uh, we got a whipping. And um, when we got done being disciplined by mom or dad, Dad would make us go sit down, and he would open up the Bible and point out how many scriptures we had to memorize. And if you didn't memorize them in 30 minutes, when he came back, you got another whipping. Oh, that's just awful. Well, out of five boys, four of us are Pentecostal preachers. So something stuck, got took and stuck and whatever. So um, I believe that the words that Jesus said, that in the last day there will be a famine for the word of God, not food or water for the word of God, we're there literally there. It's astounding to me of how little people know about the Bible. How little people know about the Word of God. Now, I'm going to dive into some things and I'm going to do it on purpose just to mess with your head on this Easter because you come here to sing and feel like, you know, we can all do this and go hunting. And that's fine. But my job is to mess you up today. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. Here Friday night, I had Sister Nicole, I had her print out the papers that you guys stood and read uh, because my mind was spinning when I was here Friday night because you would read the scriptures and people were touched and that's all great and it's fine but if you don't have knowledge and understanding of what Jesus actually done that we're celebrating today okay you understand Jesus didn't resurrect on Easter um, there was no Easter okay it's just today that we celebrate uh, Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December. It's the day we celebrate. I don't have a problem with that. As a matter of fact, we are Christians, believers in Christ, and the Bible, not God, not a disciple, not Jesus, not an apostle, called us Christians not one time. The only time you find the word Christians in the Bible is in the book of Acts. Uh, at Antioch, when a bunch of idol worshipers called those who believed that Jesus was the Christ, they called them Christians. They called them little Christ. It was not a compliment. It was mockery. Now, I don't have a problem with the title of Christian that, that I am. It has grown to mean that. Uh, meaning of words change. They change. I understand that. Uh, but make sure it changes for the better. Now, when I was a kid, a mouse was a rodent. Uh, it's now on a computer. Um, a keyboard was connected to a piano. 
is also a computer. When I was a kid, a web is where the spiders were. Um, how many is old enough to know what I'm talking about? Just to tell what we're saying. <laughs> I'm seeing some young people looking at me kind of strange. Uh, when I was a kid, long on is what you've done to the stove. Um, a hard drive was a long trip in a car. <laughs> and, uh, microchips was the, in the bottom of a potato chip bag. I guess that's, that's, that's how I grew up. And so understand that meanings of words change. But you remove the S from the word Christians and it's only found two times. The first time is later in the book of Acts when King Agrippa said to Paul, you're such a good preacher, you almost persuade me to become a little Christ. And then later Simon Peter said, if they call you a Christian, don't worry about it. Take it like a lick on the chin and just keep on trucking. So that's how we're going to go for the next 30 minutes. My goal is to let you uh, out of here at noon uh, because it is Easter. Now, I said that's my goal, uh, just so as you know. As you understand, sometimes goals are missed. Uh, in St. John chapter number 18, the um, pastor quoted this scripture Friday night, and I want to start there. I'm going to try not to preach to you. I'm going to try to teach and instruct you. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden, and he entered, and his disciples, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, coming thither with lanterns and weapons, torches and weapons, and Jesus, therefore knowing... Uh, the, uh, that uh, what should come upon him went forth and said to them, Seek ye. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus said, I am he, and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Now, that's not the one the pastor read, read from 13, and I'll read in just a moment. But here's the story of the, uh, the, the, the three days before Easter. Now, understand that Easter is not uh, the day that Jesus resurrected, Easter was a um, uh, uh, was something that we added later, originally pagan, I hope we know all of that kind of stuff. But it is a sacred day for us as Christians because this is the day that we celebrate that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. It doesn't matter if it's crucified on Friday or Wednesday or Thursday, resurrected Sunday or Saturday, it doesn't really matter. The point is, he resurrected, okay? Now you can argue about antiques and you can argue about times and dates. Um, if you have a question about that, you can come to me after service, and I'll be glad to explain to you um, about the calendar and how the things work and, and the day that Jesus resurrected. He was actually crucified on Passover, okay? Jesus was crucified on Passover, and he resurrected early in the morning of the first day of the week. My brother Caldwell, that's Sunday. Well, no, actually not, because the one that wrote that, who wrote that scripture, was actually a Jew. And if you look from a Gentile perspective in the Word of God, uh, sometimes you can miss things. Because if you understand Jews and the Jewish calendar, uh, Sunday does not start uh, at sunrise on Sunday morning. It starts at sunset on Saturday evening. And so we'll get into all of that. And so Jesus was actually crucified uh, uh, at, at Passover because the Last Supper meal that, that Jesus had with his disciples, the Last Supper that we celebrate, is actually a Passover meal. And when they read here Friday night, that Jesus made the statement that I will not eat uh, bread nor will I drink from the fruit of the vine until I say to you again. Now we do know after the resurrection of Jesus, he called the disciples from the sea, uh, walking on the shore, there's bread and fish on the fire. So Jesus wasn't actually talking about that I will not uh, eat physically with you. He was talking about, I will not eat of the Passover meal, the communion that we take. Now, now my grandson, i got to tell you this story. Uh, my grandson was here Friday night, and they began to pass out the bread and, and pass out the grape juice, and, and my son-in-law back there was outside with the baby, and when my five-year-old grandson came out, he said, Dad, was you, was you not inside when they were handing out samples? I thought that's one of the funniest things I think I've heard in years, okay? Because from his viewpoint, and my daughter Kayla made a point last night of speaking with, uh, we was there talking about uh, influence of the church and was talking with Brian and, uh, and Jason. My grandson, if the Lord tarries, will remember Friday night service uh, I promise you, until he is late in life, he will remember that because it made an impact upon him, and that gives me, as Grandpa, later on, and even now, but when he can get it, to explain to him that this 
is the same thing that we've done here Friday night is what Jesus done the night before he was crucified. Now, when I grew up and we took communion, but Steve, I was, dad, my dad, the pastor, would get up and he would read the scripture when we take communion. He would say this. He would read and say, if you eat or drink unworthily, you drink damnation to your soul. Now, now, as a as a young uh, preacher's kid, uh, four brothers and a sister, I was sitting there and I was holding that cup and that cracker, and 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 I knew good and well that I wasn't where I needed to be with God. And if I eat this and I drink this, I'm going to hell. And I know that because Dad just read the scripture unworthily that you're going to hell. But I knew if I didn't eat it and I and I didn't drink it as the pastor's son, there would be hell after church. So I had a choice. Hell today or postpone it. So I would postpone hell. Okay, that, come on, y'all remember those days. So y'all may not have that wonderful race in hand. But, but understand, that's not what it was about. See, communion actually... Passover, uh, communion didn't start that night before Jesus was crucified. It started thousands of years before in the tabernacle in the wilderness when God laid out the bread and the wine on the table of showbread and the priest actually, 2,000 years before Jesus Christ showed up, the priest actually called it the bread of presence. So when you take communion, I don't know if you've ever been there, just, there's a sense of just reverence, you know. It, it just is. Why is that? It's just, it's a piece of bread and, and it's grape juice. And, and now I'm, I'm not an alcohol drinker. I've just never cared for the taste of it and that, that's whatever. But uh, there are some churches and, and they use real alcohol and, and I'm not, and I'm kind of sensitive to it. And, and when we was at the Garden Tomb a few years ago, uh, they had got us mixed up with one of the Catholic groups. And, and, unbeknownst to, and unbeknownst to me, I thought I was getting grape juice. And so several of the Pentecostal people, with me, when I said, let us drink, we done this. And a couple of us went, <coughs> um, it wasn't quite what we thought it was. But, but understand, it's not about the grape juice. It's not about the bread. It's about the remembrance of him. So you go to St. John chapter number 13. And... Um, Chapter 13, the scriptures that Pastor read, I want to just break down for you real quick. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that an hour was come, and he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, were in, uh, uh, which were in the world, and he loved them unto the end. And, and supper being ended, and the devil having now put in the heart of Judas his carriage, Simon, son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God to return again. That's what that means there. Uh, it says he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself and poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet uh, uh, to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now those two verses, you just have a picture of the Last Supper. I mean, you've, you've been any, any, any kind of um, traditional religion You've seen the picture of Jesus and the disciples at the Last Supper. You've seen that picture. Michelangelo painted this, the, the, the beautiful picture of the Last Supper on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And that's great. It's beautiful. I don't have a problem with it. But that ain't what it was like at all. Okay? Uh, see, at this time, uh, at the Passover meal, every, the, the table was in a, a U-shape. Kind of, you know, here, kind of like you'd line up tables in the fellowship hall. And they're only about eight to ten inches from the floor. So when they would eat the Passover meal, they actually are in a lounging position. And actually, even now, at the traditional Passover meal, they're sitting and even some are lounging because they can now, they're no longer in slavery. That's what it means, that they can now relax and they're comfortable and they're free. That's what that means. Well, that's what Jesus uh, was doing here at the Last Supper. John was here on this side, and, and Judas was over here. Now, see, John was only 17 and a half years of age at the Last Supper. So uh, uh, John was still just a kid. You, you can check his age and when he died, and, and he was 17 and a half years old, which astounds me, Brother Jason. That means when Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. But see, there was a 14-year-old kid that come climbing out of that boat <laughs> and, uh, and never wavered not one time. They tried to make him waver. 
boiled him in oil to get him tonight. Wouldn't you love to see that? Oh, I would, oh I'd love to see it because, see, John wouldn't die. Amen. Uh, see, they boiled John in oil and said, deny Christ. And he says, I'm not going to. And they shove him. Go read your history books. And then they shove him in and stir him up, I'm sure, with a big stick. And I see that little fat ball headed preacher swim over to one side of the pot and jump up on the edge and wipe oil out of his eyes, blow it out of his nose, and spit it out of his mouth. Say what you want to, but I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his and back under he go. Swim to the other side and come out according to the scripture. That is John, a 14-year-old kid, made a decision to follow Jesus Christ at just the beginning of his teenage years, and he stood firm. And now we have the wonderful book of Revelation that tells us of how in times that we are in is going to be uh, carried out, and that is that we are now seeing it confirmed, and that all happened because a 14-year-old kid made one decision. Don't tell me that these kids are too young. Don't tell me my five-year-old don't know what's going on. You need to understand, train them in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Now give the Lord a hand and praise. Amen. So, so when you read the night before the crucifixion, that we're now celebrating the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection, when you, when, you, when you read that, you have to know that it was Passover. They're laying down. John is here. That's why John was able to lay his head upon the bosom of Jesus because all they had to do was just look at it. Okay? Because then, now watch. See, there was two disciples that had, if you would, and nowadays you've got to watch what you say because people run with it, but a, a, a friendship, an intimate friendship with Jesus Christ. One laid his head on his bosom and the other put a kiss on him. One was out to serve him, the other was out to kill him. And it is imperative in your life that you have the spirit of discernment about you that you can tell the difference between John and Judas. Because if you don't, <laughs> you're going you, you to get cut up a lot. And I mean, and it just amazes me. Well, you preach on, I was hurt in church. I mean, well, okay, number one, um, take a number and get in line there, princess. Okay? Uh, if you've been in church more than 30 days, some idiotic Pharisee has said something stupid. Are y'all right here? So, preacher, you don't sound like Jesus. Well, your first mistake was thinking I was Jesus. Now that that's established, we'll move on, okay? So I, I'm just kind of a blunt talker. But but it amazes me. Uh, you you probably the same people said they're hurt in church. You probably got the feelings hurt at work. But you never hear them say, I'm, 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 I was hurt at work. I was hurt at the mall. I, you know, I'm court hurt. I'm mall hurt. I'm job hurt. Why is it I'm church hurt? <laughs> If not, clap in here and move on quickly. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. So what? I'm just pointing out something to you that the enemy of your soul, his number one key is distraction. And when distraction begins to happen, the next step is deception. So don't be distracted from the word of God. Don't be distracted. Don't be distracted from the word of God. Amen. Well, I don't understand the word of God. Well, you know, sometimes I don't either. Sometimes I do, and this happens to be one of them. The Bible says that Jesus rises from supper. See, if you were the honored guest, still yet today, at Passover, the honored guest at a feast should never have to get up from the position he will be served, she will be served, that honored guest at that position. So any time at a Jewish feast that an honored guest gets up out of the chair, something, everybody knows that something is desperately wrong. So the Bible said that Jesus rises from supper. So what's the problem? When we go back to chapter 12, you'll find out that they're there and they're discussing and the disciples are getting into a little bit of discussion about who's going to sit on the left and who's going to sit on the right. Now Jesus has already rebuked them for that and in 24 hours his earthly body is laying in a, in a, in a cave with a stone rolled in front of it on the other side of Jerusalem from where they were having the last supper and his disciples still don't have it so he had to get their attention he had to get up he had to get up and do something so when Jesus got up from his place of honor and his place of authority everybody knew that something had to be corrected but see that's not the first time that Jesus the word had got up from a place of authority and exaltation. Come on. <laughs> See, because before he was Jesus, he was the Word. Now, no, 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 kind of, I, I, I get to get this done, but we're going to take a quick theological crash, crash course. You ready? 
See, Genesis 1 and 1 says, and, and, and Jason, Brother Chris and Brother Jason says it, if you talk to Dr. Caldwell theology, you're going to end up in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. That's exactly right, because that's where it all started. All in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. So now watch closely. And, uh, oh, you need some coffee? Uber. Sorry. Oh, it's Uber? Okay, thank you. You know a hand clap, thank you. Yeah. 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 You saved me. You need coffee. Okay. Late night last night, was it? Okay, all right. <laughs> See what? In the beginning, Genesis 1 and 1, it says, Berashit bara elohim et hashemayim ba'et vaharetz. Ba'et vaharetz. Babu, babu. In the beginning created God the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Those two verses alone will send you into a theological tailspin. Because, see, the phrase in Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning. It is the Hebrew word, bet It is bet, resh, aleph, shin, yud, tav. Now, understanding the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and, and it's, it's the language of God. It's because it's, just, no, just leave it alone. We'll be here for, until 3 o'clock. Okay, it's the language of God. It's got 22 letters in it, and every letter in the Hebrew alphabet is a letter, a word, a number, and a picture. And before the written alphabet, before the written alphabet of Hebrew, they had pictures, like the Egyptians had hieroglyphics, okay? Uh, they had pictures that they wrote with. And, and Yud, uh, Bet, Resh, uh, Aleph, let me turn around. Bet, Resh, Aleph, uh, Shin, Yud, Ta. Bet, Ashi, because Hebrew reads from the right to left. See, Bet is the second letter. We have our B. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. B, Bet. It was, it was shaped like this. And it was the original picture was like the, the floor plan of a tent. But you read Hebrew from right to left, and so Bet has just like this and a, and a foundation. It's an open door of a house that you read from right to left. You have, you're coming out of the house. See, the second letter in the word Benashi in the beginning, the first word in the Bible, is Resh. The picture for Resh was a head, which was the leader. So the first two letters in the Bible is the plan coming out of the house, the leader. But see, Bet Resh, those two letters together spell son. Aleph is strong and mighty. The first three letters of the first word in the Hebrew Bible says, Out of the house of the Father comes a strong son who is mighty. Just the first three letters. And then you have Shem, which is to destroy. And then you have the smallest letter, Yud, looks like an apostrophe. And the picture is astounding. Go look it up. Of Yud, before they had the written letter, it's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Before they had the written letter, it was an arm and an elbow, a forearm and a wrist and a hand with a nail or a stick driven in the wrist. That was the picture for the letter Yud. The last letter of the word Berashit is Tal and is just simply a cross. So if you break down the six letters, because Shem Yud Tal spells thorns. So the first six letters of the, 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 the first word in the Bible says, Out of the house of the Father comes a son who's strong and mighty, who will destroy with a wounded hand and thorns on a cross. That's what it says in the first word. <laughs> Anybody need it now? <laughs> so Moses said in the beginning, God, Elohim, Barashit. In the beginning, Barashit Barah. In the beginning created God. English says God created. But in the Hebrew it says, in the beginning created God at uh, 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 the heavens, Hashemayim, which is plural. Now you can look at your Bible, anybody that's got a Bible in your hand, and you can go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and I promise you, some of the Bibles have got an S on it, and some do not. On the word heaven. Just go ahead, take a look. Let me show you. Am I boring y'all? Are y'all good? Y good? Okay. See, see, what do you got? You have an S. Who's got a Bible that says heaven, and there's, there's no S on it? Just look. You can look at electronic version. Genesis 1 and 1. It's the first one. Anybody? Are you looking? Nobody's looking. Oh, they are looking. Oh, they're right. Got woman no S on it. Got woman an S on it. Why is there a difference? Okay? Because somebody. What's that? Yours got S? Yours got S? Oh, then y'all got good electronic versions. <laughs> See what? 
Somebody took it upon themselves to remove it. See, it's not heaven singular, it's heaven's plural. Yeah. In the beginning, the creator of all things, God. I said, let's, can I just break down real quick the names of God? Okay, look here. 72 names of God in the Hebrew. 72. God gave himself all 72 names. Why does God have 72 names? Because Solomon wrote and said, the heaven, even the heavens cannot contain thee. If the heavens can't contain him, one name can't explain it. One name can't describe it. So God gave himself 72 different names in the word of God. And the first one is God Elohim, the creator of all things. Now watch. Moses says, look at it. Moses says, in the beginning, Bereshit, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes through 13 methodical steps in six days of creation. And he says, light, air, dry ground, sea, sun, moon, fish, fowl, rest. That's the six days, 13 steps methodically of creation. But in John 1 and 1, John says, in the beginning was the word. Now, the only place, two places in the Bible you find the phrase in the beginning is in John 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 1. They're both the same beginning. But see, Moses follows his phrase of in the beginning with what happened after the beginning began. But John follows his phrase of in the beginning with what was before the beginning began. Because you're Greek, most of y'all are Greek, you understand that there's negative verbs in Greek. There's no negative verbs in English. A negative verb in Greek, in Hebrew, and in Latin, the only three languages that have it, a, a, a negative verb doesn't have a negative connotation. It just literally means that a, a, a negative verb at the end of a sentence means that what I'm about to say actually happened before what I just said. So I could fill that wall up with my handwriting. When I got down that corner of that post, I could put a negative verb in the Greek and start on the next wall. It means that that wall of what I write actually happened before that wall. That's what the word was is in John 1 and 1. So John says in the beginning, you remember what Moses said? All that creation, he done a good job. So let me tell you what Moses is talking about. In the beginning, six days, 13 methodical steps. John said, in the beginning, oh, by the way, was. <laughs> See, wait, Moses done a good job there. But what he's talking about, in the beginning, by the way, was the Word. And before it was the Word, he was with God. And before he was with God, he actually was God. But when the beginning began, the one that was before the beginning began, the same was in the beginning. So what John said is before the beginning began, he had actually already begun. But when the beginning began, actually began, he was here then and everything after that that was made was actually made by him because he was before it all began. <laughs> It didn't make your head spin. Understand? <laughs> so you have to understand that when Jesus got up from supper on the Passover three days before his resurrection, the, 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 what we're celebrating here, what we're celebrating actually here, would have happened. Uh, come on, come on, come on. I look here. <laughs> Jesus died on a Wednesday. Why? Because he's in the tomb 72 hours. Not 36, 72. Now I know there's people that try different spins and try to fit, but it ain't happening. Jesus was in the tomb Wednesday night and Thursday day. Thursday night, Friday day, Friday night, and Saturday day. And when the sun had gone down the beginning of the first day of the week, he has it resurrected on Saturday night. That's why the light was so bright, the soldiers had eyes that adjusted dark, and they thought, oh, y'all not even hit me up. And they didn't discover until the next morning. Go read Mark chapter number nine, you'll see it. Okay? Well, not now. Okay, but <laughs> he said, I got to see this. <laughs> so the Bible says, the night of Passover, when they're celebrating what they've celebrated for 2,000 years, Jesus said, I will not do this again until I sit with you. There's a day coming. And we're going to enter what's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. See? about all oh, the talk that's going to be. Man, it's a few people I need to talk to. But when the festivities began, I could see the king of kings stand up at the end of that big old table, take his leg and just push his chair out and listen to it break on the golden floor. And he's going to pick up a cup and a piece of wine, a cup of wine and a piece of bread, brother, and he's going to say, I promise you <laughs> that I would not partake of this meal until I sit with you again. That is what he's talking about. So what does that mean? He came from God and he went back to God. So when he got up from supper and the Passover supper, everybody knew something had to be fixed because he got up from a seat and place of authority, but that ain't the first time he got up because he got up in glory when he was the word. Amen. Amen. 
to become flesh. And then it says, he rises from supper and laid aside his garment. Ain't that crazy? Why would he take off his outer garment? Because that ain't the first time he's done that. Because when he got up in glory, you see, he stood up to come to earth. He had to lay aside his deity of the Godhead. Oh, y'all not even here. Because see, if he would have came in the form that he was in, man would have been blinded. But he came as a servant. See, Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of what? A servant. It was found in the likeness of man. Being found in the likeness of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. So the God part, the word part of God, how do you want to look at God? I don't want to argue with you about that. How do you want to look at it? That word adorned himself, but before he left, Glory, he had to lay aside that outer garment. And in, in the Last Supper, it says he laid aside his garment and he took a towel and wrapped around himself. What does that mean? Because when the Word got up in glory from his place of exaltation, he laid aside that form that he had and took up in the form of servant, which is represented by the towel that he wrapped around him. Yes. Now, when Jesus, that why, well, God said, why does God know? Why does Jesus need a body? Why does God need a human body? Because, see, the wages of sin is death. And a spirit and a God don't die. So they needed a human body that can die to pay the wages of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. A spirit don't bleed. So they need a body to bleed in order for the forgiveness of sin. Now what's crazy, the Bible says that he wrapped himself in a garment and began to pour water into a basin. See, when the soldier stabbed him in the side on the cross, what came out? Blood and what? Because water is always the word. See, when I grew up in Pentecost, water was the Holy Ghost. That's what he said. That's what he said. See, Jesus said, out of your bed I shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Holy Spirit. See, he didn't speak call it the Holy Spirit, he spake of. He spoke with the authority of the Holy Spirit. The water is always the Word. Always the Word. Anytime you find water in the Bible, it's connected to the Word. See, that's why Moses couldn't go to the Promised Land after smiting the rock the second time. See, the rock followed them according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 3 and 4. It said, they did not all the same spiritual meat, did not all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank from that rock that followed them. So whether it disappeared, reappeared, scooted, rolled, floated, I don't know. But the rock that Moses smoked the first time is the rock he smoked the second time. And when he smoked the rock the second time, God said, that's it. Can't go to promised land. Now, when I studied that as a young preacher, I'm like, really, God? Really? Don't you think you're being a little petty? <laughs> oh, I would never talk to God like you talk to God. Well, that's because you think just because it don't come out of your mouth, he don't know. So I just be honest with you. Look <laughs> okay? at See, why didn't Moses go to the promised land the second time? After smiting the rock the second time. Why couldn't he go? Because the devil could have had a heyday with the Old Testament. Because the Bible said, Paul wrote and said, they all eat of the same spiritual meat, and they not all drink the same spiritual drink, and they drank from that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So therefore, Christ is to be spent once, and after that you speak to him, and he gives you living water that you'll never thirst again. So when Moses smoked the rock the second time, he was crucifying Christ the fresh. Y'all not even here right now. <laughs> See, he's crucifying Christ the fresh. So therefore, if you understand that water is the word, that's why John on the Isle of Patmos said, I heard a voice behind me with the sound of many waters. When I turned to see, what did he see? He saw Jesus in his glorified form. That's what he saw. So therefore, water, whether it be a rock, is always Jesus. Whether it be the one that David threw, the one that Jacob laid his head on, or the one that Moses smote, water and rock. In the Bible, it's always, a door is always Jesus. Always. Jesus said in John 10 and 9, I am the door. So when he got up from supper, he got up in glory. He had already done that. And then when he laid aside his garment, he had already done that. When he wrapped himself in a towel, he had adorned a human body. He began to pour out water and, and into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet with what? With the towel that he had on. Why? Because the towel represented the body that was going to bleed, that was going to cleanse us from our sins. And so therefore, when Jesus wrapped himself in a towel, he had to wipe them with the towel because the towel represented... Y'all don't even hear about that. He had to wrap himself with a towel that was wrapped around him because that's what cleanses you from sins of love of Jesus. Amen. There's a church today in North Carolina, and I want to 
will not call their name and put out the word that says we will not talk about on Sunday, we will not talk about the blood of Jesus because it's so gruesome and people, people, it just offends them. The blood is offensive. Yes. To sinners, of course it is. Yes. I can tell that so-called pastor hireling, you're not a church, and it's my prayer that a good solid F5 tornado come through and flatten your building after your insurance lapses the week before. <laughs> well, that's not very Jesus. I didn't told you we'd settle that issue. <laughs> so, but here's what's crazy. He goes to Simon Peter and he'll wash my feet. He said, well, you know, you're no part of me. And the pastor read this. And he said, well, not my feet, but on my hands and my head. Why? Your feet is your walk with God. Your hand is your service to God. Your head is your thought life. Simon Peter said, put the word in my walk, my work, and my thought. See? And then he says, watch, in verse 12. That's what I want you to get to the other night. <laughs> so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know you what I have done? Know what I've done? After he done what? After he washed them, after he cleansed them, he took his garment. Which one? The one that he had taken off. But watch, he never took the towel off. Which represents the body. So when he went back to his place of exaltation at the Passover supper table in Jerusalem and picked up his garment he had on, he looked at him showing his glorified deity was going to glorify the towel. <laughs> He's going to glorify the body. And that's why he became like us so we can become like him. He leaves, and look here. This is those scriptures right here. And, and everybody read them. And I'm, I'm literally standing back there by the door. And, and, and I'm telling you, my eyes switching. I, I just, I, uh, because you read this scripture and I'm going, oh my God, let him get what he actually done. And he leaves there and goes to the garden. Now you'll find that in John chapter 18, what I read to you. And the soldiers came. Here they come. Roman soldiers. The battalion was from 400 to 600 Roman soldiers. So at least 500 soldiers came out after Jesus. The ninth Passover. And they read the scripture. Are you come out for me like a thief? That's what Jesus said. It's in Mark chapter 14. See, so watch. See, you have to take the Gospels. Not, not all the stories are the same as the Gospels. Not all of them are the same. Everybody's got their own point of view and tells exactly what they saw. Some tells one thing, some tells another. It's not a controversy. It's not a controversy. They're telling, look here. I can see something that took place. Me and most people and Jason can see something and we can go home and tell it and every one of us is going to have a different version. Yeah. All of them are true. But we all saw something different. Well, see, Mark, who was, uh, uh, lived uh, about three miles from where uh, Jesus was in the garden, okay, the book of Mark, he tells a story and says that the soldiers came out. Well, let me just read it to you. Can I take time to read it to you? Okay, we're celebrating Easter. You need to know this. Mark chapter 14. That's about verse number 43. There it is. And immediately he spake. And he spake, come to Judas, one of the twelve, multitude with swords and staves, and chief priests, and scribes, and elders, and betrayed him, the one that betrayed him, and said, Whomever I kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away. As soon as he was come, he went straight away to him and said, Master, Master, and he kissed him. And they laid their hands on him, and they took him. And one of them drew a sword. Okay? Um, which we know that was Simon Peter, but Mark knows that was Simon Peter, says one of them drew a sword. And, 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 he, and he smote the priest, the, the, the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. See, do you know that on the Day of Atonement, so what Jesus was fulfilling, the officiating priest literally had to prepare the sacrifice. And go, go read the, 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 the Talmud. Go read the uh, Midrash. You'll find out that the priest, when he got ready for the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar, he had to stay up all night long and prepare the sacrifice. Jesus prayed all night long the night before he was crucified because not only was he the sacrifice, he was the officiating priest. And see, according to the law, if the priest that night prepared the sacrifice for the atonement, if he so much as pricked his finger, he had to stop, go back, clean up, and start all over again. You know why? Because there was, they didn't want what was called a mingling of blood. So why did Jesus fix the soldier's ear? <laughs> Because in the process, they can't be bloodshed. <laughs> I y'all be thinking here right now, okay? And see, Mark says, watch, cut off his ear, and Simon Peter wasn't, he wasn't aiming for his ears, aiming for his head. <laughs> Soldier was quick, and he ducked, and he cut off his ear. Jesus picked it up, and, and I, 
I'm stuck. I know. I'm stuck right there. Yeah. And Jesus said, you come out like against a thief, <clears throat> swords and sticks. I was daily in the temple. And, and, and the scriptures. But, you know, and you didn't touch me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. And the officers took him. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him assembled all the chief priests and the scribes and elders. And, and see, I just read that story to you. And I removed two verses out of the book of Mark. And you didn't even know it. Because the story reads, it has, has a flow without those two verses. I was daily with you in the temple, and you took me not, but the scripture must be fulfilled. And the officers took him and fled, and they led Jesus away to the high priest. See how that flows? Yeah. But I jumped in verse 15. See, now you're reading it. Pastor, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> don't get there before I do, please. All right? See, I took out verse 51 and 52, and Mark is the only disciple that even mentions it. Where are they? They're in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm going to Israel. Uh, I, mean, I was in Israel when the war broke out. And... Uh, I was there, I saw what Hamas did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as people get upset, oh, you, know, you need to show the love of Jesus. No, no, no. There comes a time that you have to fight. And you don't take a four-month-old baby and hold it down in front of his parents and chop its head off with a garden hole. There is no rehabilitation for that. You need to die. Period. And I looked at that people and said, somebody got on Facebook, show, what about the love of Jesus? Well, bring your love of Jesus. I'll take you to Israel. We'll put you in Gaza, and I'll tell your family how that worked out for you. Because there comes a time that you have to stand up for what is right. Because a man that won't take care of his family is worth an infidel. Let's don't get into that, okay? They, they let him, okay, look here. Mark says, and the officers took him and fled. And then I read, and they led Jesus away. And listen to the two verses in front of it. The officers took him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, had in linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. Oh, what? <laughs> oh, excuse me, Mark? And Mark said, man, the soldiers, and Judas comes up and kissed him on the cheek, and there's betrayal, and, and the soldiers, and Jesus spoke to him, and they said, who are you looking for? And he said, um, Jesus, and I'm he and 500 soldiers fell down, and, and everybody, who away that powerful? And then they look here, if you go to arrest somebody, and he says, I'm he, and you get knocked down, you might want to reconsider arresting that guy. <laughs> but Mark says, oh, by the way, there was a naked guy. <laughs> so, happy Easter. <laughs> a lot of naked people in the Bible. You should read the Bible. And he was naked, not ashamed. After all, they were ashamed. Simon Peter fished naked. Isaiah preached naked. Oh, look at it. Look, I'm not up here to take a big pro nudity stance. I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> but naked people in the Bible. And it's to hear Bart said, there's a naked guy in the Garden of Gethsemane. Hmm. Well, what in the world? What in the world? See, you have to go and read John 18. The one I read to you, Jesus said, I am me. I ain't me. Uh, I am me. I am me. E I am I. Those of you that know Greek. I am me. And it's an all encompassing word. It's the same word that Jesus used at the tomb of Lazarus. See, and I'm going to break this down because I'm, I'm done at my noon and I'm. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to see him up there. And you told him to hide and land on top of the ground. I know okay, we got to do something about that. What the... I, well, sorry, we'll fix it. Okay, I'll have a good egg, put a hundred dollars in it. The dogs will be looking. All right, no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> See, Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. Martha still, my brother, my brother, and I. And Jesus said, "I am the resurrection." So you have to know they're already in the cemetery. And when Jesus said, "I am," e me, e me, it's the same word he used in the garden. It's only two places it's found in the Bible. See, and that's why when Jesus told Lazarus to come out of the tomb, he specifically said Lazarus. Because see, anybody buried, ah, see, watch. The phrase uh, linen cloth cast about his naked body, there's nine Greek words that can be translated into linen cloth. But all nine of the words is a different kind of cloth. But in English it just says cloth or linen cloth. This one here, Mark 14, there's only one other event in the entire Bible where you find that Greek word. And that's at the crucifixion of Jesus when they took him off the cross and wrapped his body in a linen cloth. It's the same word here in Mark 14. Because that phrase, linen cloth, is freshly buried grave clothes with two to three days before corruption sets in. 
So Mark says, there's a young man out there who had on fresh and very gray clothes before corruption set in. So you could go with me to Israel this October when I'm taking a group. I'll let you stand in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'll show you right there in the valley. There's graves there that are over 2,000 years old. Because in the valley, there was a cemetery, and up on the hill, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane where the olive press was. See, when the soldiers come walking like this, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus. And he turned and said, I'm the all-encompassing resurrection. It was so powerful, it knocked down 500 soldiers. But there's a young man there with fresh and very grave clothes. See, my personal opinion is, somebody who had just been buried, the word of resurrection hit that cemetery that knocked down them soldiers, and he got up and started walking around. And the soldiers grabbed him and said, what you doing out here at the grave clothes? Forget this. He let the grave clothes just run off and make it. <laughs> See, all that happened, and we come on Easter, the singer songs, not even realizing it. You need to know what he done for you. That he's beaten, crucified, a spirit inside, and he cries out, Eli, Eli, Lama Salakana, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? You know what they told me when I was a kid? God can't look on sin. God turned his back. And Jesus said, What? Who's ever heard that story? That's the biggest lie you'll ever hear. God didn't turn his back on Jesus. If God turned his back on his only begotten son, I ain't got a stake and chance. I know some of y'all are a lot more holy than I am, but I got issues. <laughs> so spiritual straighten your halo. <laughs> See, my God. See, why did Jesus say, my God, why is I forsaken me? Because if you go read Psalm number 23, you'll find that the Lord is my shepherd. Okay? If you read Psalm number 24, you'll find that He's crowned as king. But in Psalm 22, let me see there. Psalm number 22 and verse number 18. You've got to see this. I'm trying to help somebody right now. Okay? In verse number 18, David writes, and he says, They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. See, David is writing about the crucifixion. In Psalm 23, he writes about being a good shepherd. And in Psalm 24, he writes about him coming back. So Psalm 22 is about the crucifixion. You'll never believe what the first verse in Psalm 22 says. And he cried out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? God didn't turn his back on Jesus on the cross. Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. He was quoting scriptures. Because David wrote about the crucifixion in Psalm 22. And it starts with, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Jesus took one more shot at ministry before he drew his last breath to let everybody know what you're seeing is a fulfillment of scripture that you've read about your entire life. Thank you, Lord. That's what you read this when he said that. And I went through my teenage years saying, boy, better watch out. God turns back on you. <laughs> Old bull butter. He won't either. <laughs> oh, y'all don't do that here in some sort. It's just something sad. <laughs> See, watch. And then he's in the tomb for three days. 72 hours. 72 hours. Jesus is in the tomb. 72 hours. Jesus is in the I'm going to explain this to you 72 hours Jesus not Christ Jesus was in the tomb because Christ was in the beginning was the word he was before it began and he was after it began and that word that Christ never dies but the body that he adorned the towel was laying in the tomb for 72 hours. Jesus was in the tomb, but Christ went on a missionary journey <laughs> to the heart of the earth. Because in the garden, God said he was going to bruise his head and his head. Bru Are y'all even here this Easter yeah. Sunday? <laughs> know what he has done for you and what you're celebrating today. Thank God for the kids who's going to go pick up eggs. We're going to be excited about that. Whatever egg they pick up, that's wonderful. Thank God for Peter Cottontail. <laughs> but I know why we're here. We're here because the God of the universe that was adorned a human touchable body. 
and died in it. Did he want to? No. He didn't want to. My God, why has thou forsaken me? Oh, watch. I'm going to do one more and I'm going to quit. But these papers Friday night flipped my wig. Because he read it in order. How it happened. And I'm just back at watch. See, Jesus said, no man takes my life. They read the one about Pilate. Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus said, well, do you say that yourself? You hear somebody else. Jesus said, hey, do you know that I'm a king or is that just taking hand of information? <laughs> or is your kingdom? My kingdom of this world. It was. My, my servants would fight for me. The Bible says that from that moment, Brother Steve, Pilate sought to release him. Because Pilate understood authority. He understood authority. And Jesus spoke with authority and he talked to him in kingdom terms. And Jesus said, they can't nobody take my life. I lay it down. If I wanted to, I could call for what? Twelve Amen. legions Amen. of angels. How many is a legion? Two thousand, known as two thousand. At two thousand hit a hole, but a man was cast out who had six thousand demons. Because the word legion is a Roman word, six thousand. So therefore, Jesus said, I can call for 72,000 angels and bear me away. But I lay my life down. When I see if you go to the book of Isaiah, the Bible says that one angel, one, went through the camp and 185,000 Syrians was dead when the sun came up. One angel and 185,000. And Jesus said, I call 12,000. I call for one legion. That's 6,000 angels. Did you know that 6,000 angels and 185,000 dead people apiece is 1,110,000,000? I know you know that. You do the math in your head. I got it. <laughs> but he didn't say, I called one legion, I called 12 legion, 72,000 angels. So therefore, 72,000 angels and 185,000 dead people apiece, 72,000 times 185,000 is 13,320,000,000, which is twice the current world's population. So what Jesus actually said is nobody lays my life down. I, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. Because I can call 12 legions of angels and wipe out the planet. <laughs> you know, some historians believe that from Adam to Jesus, approximately 12 billion people had lived and died. If that's the case, you know what Jesus said? Nobody takes my life. I give it up because I can call 12 legions of angels and wipe out human history and start all over again. But I'm praying there's great drops of blood. And I know that I can call for 12 legions of angels to wipe out the planet, wipe out human history. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Not my will, but thy will. And he stood up and said, I'm going to that cross. Because 2,024 years later, there's going to be a house church of Tarnas Branch. They need to understand that I've got a choice to die or make my exit. You'll find it also in 2 Samuel. He knew he could get out. I can die or I can make my exit. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to that cross. And now, 2,024 years later in the Gregorian calendar, we sit here on the 31st of March to celebrate Easter. We all dress up in our Sunday best come the kids enjoy it some loud mouth preacher comes up here and sweats and screams and one is Jason even at him. come because <laughs> I will not stand before God on judgment day and have one of y'all look at me and say you didn't tell me come on. Thank you. Amen. so good Friday always something good Friday it was actually it was a good Wednesday <laughs> why because Jesus died on April the 14th of the year 31 AD on the Gregorian calendar. Because Jesus was two years old when Herod died, and Herod died in the zero year. Oh, y'all not even here. <laughs> See, all that don't really matter. Have anything to do with your salvation. If you just know he died and he got up. And a lot of people in history get up out of the grave. Elijah resurrected seven. Elisha resurrected 14. But here's the kicker. Everybody that was ever resurrected from the dead died again. He conquered them. And the Bible says, Jason, that that same spirit that 
lived in him. I know it. The spirit of Christ. His body was Jesus. His spirit was Christ. My body's Randy. My spirit is Christ. Amen. He's Jesus Christ. I'm Randy Christ. He's Jason Christ. Steve Christ. Amen. Oh, call the things with little gods. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh, happy Easter. <laughs> shut up on happy Easter. I'm just saying, that same spirit. <coughs> that dwell in him now those things. That's why I'm done watch. That's why greater is he that's in you. And he is the world in the mess. You better know it. You better know it. And America's in trouble. And you don't even have a clue of how close. Before this year is over, the world is before this year, 2024 is over, the world is going to be rocked and everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken and if you don't have a foundation of the word of God you're going to panic preacher that worries me what, what are you talking about preacher that stresses me out, why would you be stressed out this says we win and I believe this we win we win. <laughs> so that's a little. Uh, has anybody's brain been completely shattered? <laughs> Good. Let's just pray because uh, you know Randy makes it look easy because he's a gifted minister and, and speaks, but how many heard something they've never heard here before? How many people are challenged to go into the Word and find out for themselves what else they're missing? How many people are hungrier now to go, who is this Jesus? Yes. Father, I thank you for your Word is truth and it is life. Lord, we just open up our hearts as best as we know how to. Lord, illuminate the eyes of our understanding. Give us understanding in these things, God. We're, we want to be believing believers. Come on. Not religious believers, but people fully engaged, dipped in the kerosene of your Holy Spirit, lit on, lit on fire to be burned before a generation that would be torches, lighting the way to you, Jesus, because you are worthy of it all. And so we just magnify you today. Lord, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for this word that is spoken, and we just call it done. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, here we go. All right, hold on a second. When I...